Anti-lock brakes represent one of the most important safety features available on new vehicles today, which explains their increasing popularity. Because Jeep has used Bendix anti-lock brakes, no doubt you've already run across many ABS-equipped vehicles and are familiar with their operation. Welcome to this month's Video Tech. In this program, we'll take a look at the new Tevis Mark IV anti-lock brake system. The Tevis system is optional on the 4-liter equipped 92 Cherokee or XJ body and standard on the upcoming 92.5 Grand Cherokee or ZJ body. This look will include an explanation of the anti-lock brake operation, the system components, operating characteristics, system service, and system diagnosis. The Tevis Mark IV system operation is similar to the Bendix system previously used on Jeep vehicles. This system uses an electronic control module called the Anti-Lock Brake Module, or ABM, to monitor wheel speeds sent by the wheel speed sensors that are mounted at each wheel. When a wheel locking tendency is detected, the ABM operates the appropriate valves in the hydraulic control unit to control brake fluid pressure to that wheel until the wheel stops the locking tendency. The Tevis Mark IV system has three separate anti-lock brake circuits. Two circuits go to the individual front wheels, so that during an anti-lock stop, directional stability and steering control are maintained. Both rear wheels are controlled by the same circuit. During non-ABS braking, the master cylinder, vacuum booster, and wheel brake units all function as they would in a vehicle not equipped with ABS. The hydraulic control unit does not influence braking performance during normal braking. Although the general operation of the Tevis anti-lock system may sound a lot like the Bendix system, there are some big differences. For example, the Tevis system uses conventional vacuum assist hydraulics as the foundation brake system, unlike the Bendix system which had a full power hydraulic assist foundation brake system. The Tevis system has no high pressure accumulator, so pressure doesn't have to be relieved when servicing the system, as was necessary on the Bendix system. Now, let's take a look at some of the components of the Tevis Mark IV system. The Anti-Lock Brake Module, or ABM, is a microprocessor-based device which monitors and controls the anti-lock brake functions. The ABM interprets the wheel speed and acceleration switch signals to monitor wheel locking tendencies. And when it finds them, it provides instructions to the hydraulic control unit to control the pressure to the appropriate wheels. The ABM also monitors the system for proper operation. If the system is not operating properly, the ABM can disable the anti-lock function triggering the ABS warning light on the instrument panel, and can store the fault in its memory. When the anti-lock functions disabled, the system reverts to standard brake system operation. The ABM allows the fault to be retrieved by the DRB2 and communicates with it to determine the system status and to test the system components. ABS faults will remain in the ABM memory until cleared or until after the vehicle's been started approximately 50 times. The ABM mounting location for the Cherokee is behind the instrument panel to the right of the steering column. For the Grand Cherokee, the ABM's located on the left front inner fender panel in the engine compartment. The wheel speed sensors are located at each wheel. These sensors send an AC signal to the ABM so that it can process the information to detect any wheel locking tendencies. The signal is generated by magnetic induction when a toothed sensor ring or tone ring passes by the stationary magnet of the wheel speed sensor. The ABM converts the signal into digital signals for each wheel. All four tone rings contain 54 teeth, but as you can see here, the front and rear tone rings are not interchangeable. 
For proper operation, it's important that the space between the tone ring and the wheel speed sensor, called the air gap, be set to the correct specifications. The front air gaps are not adjustable, but the rear gaps can be adjusted. We'll discuss how to do this later in the program. To generate accurate signals, the vehicle's wheels and tires should all be the same size and type. However, the system is designed to function when using the compact spare. The tires should also be inflated to the correct tire pressure. Tires that have pressures substantially above or below specifications can also cause the wheel speed sensors to generate inaccurate signals. The vacuum booster used with the Tevis Mark IV system provides vacuum-assisted braking in addition to housing the pedal travel sensor. The pedal travel sensor provides brake pedal stroke information to the ABM. The vacuum booster is mounted to the driver's side of the engine compartment dash panel. The master cylinder is a standard tandem design except that special center valves have replaced the conventional piston and seal assemblies. The center valve is a spring-loaded ball and seat design, which will open and close the master cylinder pressure chambers during brake application and release. The master cylinder is attached to the vacuum booster. The combination valve contains a pressure differential section with a brake warning switch and also contains a proportioning section. As on conventional systems, the pressure differential section monitors the brake fluid pressure differences between the front and rear brake circuits. And the brake warning switch turns on the brake warning light if there's sufficiently unequal pressure. The proportioning section regulates the pressure between the front and rear circuits. On the Cherokee, the combination valve is mounted in front of and slightly below the master cylinder. On the Grand Cherokee, the combination valve is mounted on top of the pump motor assembly. The hydraulic control unit, or HCU, is located on the left fender shield in front of the master cylinder on the Grand Cherokee, and on the left fender shield outboard of the master cylinder on the Cherokee. The HCU contains the pump motor assembly and also the valve block assembly. As mentioned earlier, unlike the Bendix system, this system has no high pressure brake fluid accumulator. So when the fluid, in addition to that provided by the master cylinder, is required during an ABS stop, the system relies on the pump motor assembly to resupply the fluid and also to control pedal height. Since there is no high pressure accumulator that must be kept pressurized, the pump on the Teva system doesn't have to run as often as the Bendix system. In fact, the pump only runs during anti-lock operation and the self-test procedure. The pump motor assembly is controlled by the ABM and consists of an electric motor with a rotation sensor and two pistons. The motor shaft inside the pump is designed as a cam so that it can drive both pistons. In operation, on the suction side, the pistons draw fluid from the master cylinder reservoir. On the pressure side, each piston acts as a pump for its respective hydraulic circuit. One for the primary circuit, which supplies the front wheels, and one for the secondary circuit, which supplies the rear wheels. The rotation sensor is an inductive pickup that's used by the ABM to monitor pump motor operation. The valve block assembly contains three inlet and three outlet valves. The inlet valves are spring-loaded in the open position, and the outlet valves are spring-loaded in the closed position. If a wheel locking tendency is detected, the inlet valve is closed to prevent any further pressure increase from the master cylinder. If the locking tendency remains, then the outlet valve is opened to release the pressure back to the master cylinder reservoir until the wheel locking tendency is over. Once it's over, the outlet valve is closed and the inlet valve is opened to reapply pressure from the master cylinder. 
if a consistent level of braking control has been established, both valves will close to hold the pressure constant. During the stop, the fluid pressure is initially supplied by the master cylinder. When a pressure increase is required during an ABS stop, fluid again comes from the master cylinder, which causes the pedal to drop slightly. The pedal drop is detected by the pedal travel sensor, which signals the ABM to turn on the pump motor. The pump motor then pumps fluid from the master cylinder reservoir into the brake system. The master cylinder pistons and the brake pedal are then moved back. When the brake pedal reaches a predetermined position, the pedal travel sensor signals the ABM to turn off the pump motor. When any of the brake tube connections to the HCU are opened, it's important that you follow a special brake bleeding procedure using the DRB2. We'll discuss this procedure and the reasons for it later in the program. The acceleration switch, or G-switch, is mounted under the rear seat on the driver's side. This component provides the ABM with a vehicle deceleration reference to select the proper anti-lock program, as well as providing optimum performance in four-wheel drive. When in four-wheel drive and on ice, all four wheels may decelerate at close to the same rate. If the wheel speed sensors show the wheels aren't turning, it may assume that the vehicle has stopped. The acceleration switch provides a vehicle reference to indicate that the vehicle is still moving, independent of the wheel speed signals, thereby providing another input so the ABM can maximize braking performance. The switch contains three mercury switches, two to reflect forward braking g-forces and the third to reflect rearward braking g-forces. The Bendix system had a mercury switch mounted in the electronic control unit that was also located under the rear seat. As with that system, the acceleration switch must be mounted properly to provide the ABM with accurate information. The switch has arrows on it to aid in proper positioning, and the mounting bracket has a special lip to prevent upside down mounting. Brake warning lights in the instrument panel are often the first clue that a problem exists with the brake system. The red brake warning light is on a different circuit from the amber ABS warning light and operates as it would on a non-ABS equipped vehicle. It warns of an engaged parking brake or unequal front to rear brake pressure. The ABS light warns of an ABS malfunction. When the ABS light is lit, the anti-lock function is not available. We will discuss this in the system diagnosis section later in the program. The Tevis Mark IV system contains two relays and four fuses. The ABS system relay is located in the power distribution center. This relay is also called the main relay. The ABS system relay is energized by the ABM. When energized, it provides power to the solenoid valves, the ABS pump relay coil, and the ABM power feed. When it is de-energized, it supplies a ground to illuminate the ABS warning light. The other relay, the ABS pump relay, is also located in the power distribution center. This relay has a unique terminal design and is not interchangeable with the ABS system relay. This relay receives its power through the ABS system relay from the ABM. The ABS pump relay, when energized, sends power to run the pump motor assembly. The signal to tell the ABM when to energize the pump relay, however, is generated by the pedal travel sensor. Two of the four ABS fuses are located in the fuse block. One fuse is a 5-amp fuse, and the other is a 2-amp fuse. The other two fuses are located in the power distribution center. The ABS system fuse is a 30-amp fuse on the Cherokee and a 20-amp fuse on the Grand Cherokee. The ABS pump fuse is a 40-amp fuse on the Cherokee and the Grand Cherokee. When 
the ignition switch is turned to the on or run position, power up voltage is sent to the ABM ignition terminal. It is during this time that the system goes through its first self-check procedure called a static check because it occurs when the vehicle is not moving. Right after the ABM receives the power up voltage, the amber ABS warning light comes on. After the ABM determines that the ABS system relay, the valves, and the wheel speed sensor connections are okay, the light goes out. If the light stays on for more than two to three seconds, then there is a fault in the system, and the ABS feature is not available. The next check is the dynamic check. This self-check procedure occurs when the vehicle road speed reaches approximately five to 10 miles per hour. During this check, the ABM cycles the pump to verify operation. When this happens, you may feel a slight pulsing sensation in the brake pedal as the pump cycles. When the vehicle goes into the anti-lock braking mode, the sound the pump and solenoid valves make as they cycle on and off may be noticeable. This is normal. During anti-lock braking, the driver may also feel a slight pulsing sensation within the vehicle as the solenoids adjust the brake pressure. The brake pedal will also pulsate. Another operating characteristic that you may want to be aware of is that when braking in the anti-lock mode with extremely high deceleration on different traction surfaces, such as the left wheels on ice and the right wheels on dry pavement, a modest amount of steering input may be required. The first step in diagnosing a problem with the Tevis anti-lock system is to check the simpler, more obvious causes and then progress to using the DRB2. Remember, the red brake warning light tells of problems with the basic brake system only, such as an engaged parking brake or low brake fluid. If both the amber ABS light and the red brake light are on, there may be a malfunction with the hydraulic portion of the braking system. If only the amber ABS light is illuminated, then the anti-lock system is not available. So long as the red brake light is not lit, then the vehicle will still have the base brakes with full power assist available. The next step in the diagnosis procedure is to make a visual examination of all the system components to confirm or rule out leaks, loose connections, damage, or mechanical component failures as a problem cause. The last step in diagnosis is to use the DRB2 to find a specific circuit or component at fault. The DRB2 is connected to the ABS diagnostic connector under the instrument panel on the driver's side. With the DRB2 properly connected and the battery fully charged, find out the fault code stored in the ABM. When you get to the Select Systems menu, choose ABS. The DRB2 will then test the C squared D bus. When the ABS menu appears, access Read Faults. Write down the fault message so it can be erased when you're finished. The components of the Tevis Mark IV system are not repairable, but most components can be serviced individually by replacement. The components that can be replaced separately are the master cylinder, the master cylinder reservoir, reservoir connecting hoses and clamps, power brake booster including matched pedal travel sensor, booster check valve and grommet, separate pedal travel sensor, combination valve, the HCU assembly, the ABM, the acceleration switch, wheel speed sensors, rear tone rings, front tone ring axle shaft assemblies, and the system wiring harness. Critical to the operation of the anti-lock brake system is the proper brake fluid and fluid level. The correct brake fluid is Mopar.3 brake fluid. If this is not available, then a top quality fluid meeting SAE J1703 and DOT3 standards should be used. The fluid must not only meet these standards, but must also be absolutely clean and fresh. 
never use reclaimed fluid, fluid from open containers, or fluid not meeting the previously mentioned standards. Contaminated fluid will cause system malfunctions. The fluid levels should be to the max indicator mark on the driver's side of the master cylinder reservoir. It is acceptable, though, for the level to be between the max and min marks. If the level falls below the min mark, the hydraulic system should be checked for leaks. As with any brake system, when removing the caps to check or fill the reservoir, clean the caps and exterior thoroughly to prevent any dirt or foreign material from entering the system. For the same reason, when servicing other components, it is important to cap all open lines and hoses. Let's move on to a look at some service concerns with the wheel speed sensors. For the wheel speed sensors to operate properly, the air gap between the sensor and the tone ring must be correct. The air gap on the front sensors cannot be adjusted. The rear gap, however, is adjustable. Let's take a closer look at installing and setting the air gap on a rear wheel speed sensor. If the original sensor bolt is in good condition, apply Mopar lock and seal to it prior to reinstallation. If the bolt is worn or damaged, replace it with a new one. Install the sensor bolt only finger tight at this point, since the air gap must still be set. If you're installing a new wheel speed sensor, push the cardboard spacer on the sensor face against the tone ring. The cardboard is pre-measured to give the proper air gap, and it will wear away in time. With the sensor properly positioned, tighten the sensor bolt to 11 foot-pounds. If the old wheel speed sensor is being installed, the remaining cardboard spacer material must be completely removed before the air gap can be correctly measured. When removing the old spacer material, be careful not to damage any part of the component. With the original sensor, however, the air gap will have to be measured with a brass feeler gauge prior to tightening the sensor bolt. After the bolt has been tightened to 11 foot-pounds, check the air gap again to verify it is to the correct specifications. The rear air gap should be 43 thousandths of an inch, but somewhere in the 36 to 50 thousandths of an inch range is acceptable. The front air gap range should be from 16 to 51 thousandths of an inch, but as noted earlier, it is not adjustable. Another service concern that you should be aware of is the proper method for installing a new pedal travel sensor. New replacement pedal travel sensors will come with four different color tips that are color coded to the dots on the booster shells. Care must be taken to install a sensor with a tip the same color as on the booster. When installing the new sensor, place the O-ring on the sensor and install the retaining ring to the sensor flange on the booster. Insert the sensor and check to make sure the retaining ring has properly engaged the flange and the sensor. As you'll recall from earlier in the program, the pedal travel sensor measures the pedal stroke and tells the ABM when to turn the pump motor on and off. This information is based on several steps of pedal stroke that the sensor measures. It's therefore important that when installing a new sensor, you use the DRB2 to make sure the sensor reaches the sixth step. Prior to running the pedal travel sensor test, make sure the floor mat doesn't hinder full pedal travel. Next, hook up the DRB2, and as we did before, choose ABS here. Again, the next screen will be a test of the C squared D bus. Once this test is completed, the ABS menu automatically appears. Use the directional keys to advance on through the choices until you get to the state display choice. Access state display and then access sensors. This will lead you to the PTS selection. Do not push down on the brake pedal at this time. The screen will read one steps. 
Now, go back to the ABS menu and access the actuator test selection. And while applying the brake pedal, cycle the left front outlet valve. The brake pedal should drop. While maintaining the brake pedal application, cycle the rear outlet valve. The brake pedal should drop even further, but continue to maintain pressure on the pedal. At this point, access sensors again and read the travel position. The position should read six steps. If you don't have steps one through six, then recheck the color of the pedal travel sensor tip and make sure that it matches the colored dot on the booster shell. Another service concern that is substantially different than the Bendix system is the removal of the harness to ABM connector. The connector has a lever that must first be lifted up fully. Rotate the pins to enable the connector to be rotated and pulled away. Do not try to pry the connector away from the ABM. The brake bleeding procedure for the Tevis system is different than the procedure from the previously used Bendix system. The bleed sequence is basically a three-step procedure consisting of a conventional manual bleed, a second bleed using the DRB2, and then another conventional bleed. Because of the design of the Tevis system, it is possible to leave air trapped in the HCU after a conventional bleeding procedure is followed. The DRB2 cycles the valves while running the pump to expel any trapped air. Before beginning the bleeding process, clean the master cylinder caps and fill the reservoir with fresh fluid. It's important during all the bleeding steps not to let the master cylinder run dry. This will allow more air into the system. Bleed the caliper and wheel cylinders in this order. First, the right rear wheel, second, the left rear wheel, third, the right front wheel, and last, the left front wheel. When you're doing the caliper and wheel cylinders, attach the bleed hose to the bleed fitting and immerse the other end in a glass container, partially filled with brake fluid. Be sure the hose is submerged during this process. Have a helper apply and hold the brake pedal. Now open the bleed screw one half turn. Close it when the brake pedal contacts the floor pan. Repeat this procedure five to seven times at each wheel. Continue this procedure until the glass container is free of bubbles. Again, make sure the reservoir doesn't go dry, or you'll have to do this whole procedure over. The next step is to run the DRB2 bleed brakes procedure. Using the DRB2 as we did in the pedal travel sensor installation, access adjustments in the ABS menu and then access the bleed brakes procedure. The DRB2 is now able to turn on the pump motor and cycle the valves to expel any trapped air. Once the DRB2 procedure is finished, you'll have to repeat the entire conventional bleeding procedure we just described. If you need more information on how to use the DRB2, consult the January 89 video tech using the DRB2 tester and the Jeep Eagle adapter, and the February 90 Video Tech 1990 Jeep Eagle DRB2 update. Well, that concludes an overview of the new Tevis Mark IV anti-lock brake system. You'll want to be with us for next month's Video Tech release when we'll talk about the Jeep Eagle new model highlights. We'll see you then.